Aloha mai. I think a little uh, <clears throat> protocol is uh, appropriate here, so bear with me. Aho nua, aho kua o ka ale, a ka ho kui o ho kule a. Liu liu malana i ka hua kai, e e ina ka hoa vaa lono ka hea he aloha, he aloha e. <coughs> That is um, our standard of asking permission when we sail across the seas and we voyage to another land. Of course, we ask permission ahead of time. But the way it works is <clears throat> when, we're, when we're well offshore and we've already connected with the ancestors of the land, we do the first kahea and we make that uh, connection with them. And then we come onto land where we can um, be heard by the people of the present on the land. We ask permission again. So with that, um, I want to say thank you for allowing us to be on Larakia land. And I want to thank uh, Pat and her team at Luicha for allowing us to come here to Darwin and to share a little bit about <clears throat> What we've been doing in, the, in Hawaii with voyaging in the last um, 46 years. So, you guys recognize this tree? My understanding is that this, uh, what we call hala in Hawaii, has its genesis here in Australia this pandanus tree. <clears throat> and this represents a, a basic, uh, wonderful question. When is the best time to plant the tree? Well, some people say 10 years ago um, is the best time. But if you plant the tree today, it's going to be your grandchildren and their children. They're going to enjoy the shade and the fruits of it. And it's just a metaphor for... <clears throat> When is the best time to do anything worthwhile? When you're thinking about it. I want to call into the room and into the space <clears throat> um, some really good friends. In all of our lives, there are people who influenced, influenced us very positively, family members, special friends, mentors, teachers. And as we proceed through life, we carry that spirit and those lessons that are valuable to us, that we learn from them. This individual, his name is Finihata Puaniho Tautaha. He's a Tahitian man. He's a traditional canoe builder. And as you can see, I mean, if you saw him every day, that's exactly how he would be dressed. He was just a real native person, very, very wise, very, very skilled in his art. But the most um, important thing was his values. He was very kind, very caring, very understanding, and never ever saw him raise his, heard him raise his voice or get mad. He was one of those guys of the earth, one of those people that was there to just do the right thing and help others. This fellow on the right, his name is Wally <coughs> Freuseth. He came to Hawaii with his mother and, and uh, his older brother when he was five years old. And he grew up on the beach at Waikiki in like, the, like 1921, 25. 
He would walk there about three to four miles every day, learned how to surf, learned how to canoe paddle, learned how to build canoes. He was part of the first group in the early 40s to build the first catamarans on Earth in Waikiki. Coming from, uh, you know, this uh, holy man coming from California, through his whole life, he learned to love the ocean, he learned to love the Hawaiian people, he learned to learn, love to learn the, uh, the culture. And one of the last things he told me was, hold on to the culture. <clears throat> and he was a really great teacher, self-taught in so many other things he did, and uh, a great mentor. This woman on the left, her name is uh, Clorinda Kawikeole uh, Lucas. She was the first Hawaiian woman to get a master's degree in social study. And she was a <clears throat> lifetime trustee of one of the, uh, the trusts, Ali'i Trust, which are Hawaiian trusts in Hawaii. And their trust was to take care of um, orphan and half-orphan children in Hawaii. She grew up on a ranch where most of the people around her are Hawaiians. They spoke Hawaiian. But because of a lot of um, turmoil at the time, in like the late 1800s, an overthrow of the Hawaiian government, a lot of uh, people in her generation were steered away from learning Hawaiian language and mainly speaking English. This was going to be the new world. But uh, <clears throat> the kindest, smartest, most intelligent lady. Now, if you can imagine, <clears throat> if you can imagine being like 18 years old, then like most 18 years old, pretty much rudderless in what you want to do in life, and in meeting someone like this, <clears throat> and having some really great conversations about what's the next steps and what's going on around us. So much aloha for grandma here. And this gentleman here, his name is Kalaku Kea. <clears throat> he was a mentor. In um, high school, top of his class. At West Point uh, uh, Military Academy in the U.S., top of his class. We did two tours in Vietnam as a young American soldier, came back, and everything he did, top of his class. But at the, at the underlying all of that, he was a Hawaiian man. And um, very athletic, very soft-spoken, and always willing to share and to teach. Now this brings us to our talk. Voyaging in the Pacific. This is, uh, this picture creates a vision of what <clears throat> was possible in a thousand years of voyaging in the Pacific especially in Polynesia. This is a rendering by one of the founders of the Polynesian Voyaging Society, Herb Kavainui Kane. And <clears throat> the Polynesian Voyaging Society was founded on, on a basic challenge. And here you see up in the north there, you see Hawaii. In the southeast, Easter Island, Rapa Nui. In the southwest uh, over here, Aotearoa, New Zealand. And within that triangle, there's over seven million square miles of ocean. <clears throat> and that was, and within that triangle, and even those islands to the west, when Westerners came into the Pacific, um, around the 15th, 16th century, these islands had been habitab uh, habitable and uh, inhabited for like thousands of years. So 
So this fellow, Andrew Sharp, writes this book somewhere in the 60s. And the book says that the people of Oceania probably did have some uh, education, I mean, uh, navigational skills. <clears throat> but he, he quantified it. And he said that they could, tra they could navigate purposely for 300 miles. And after that, they'd be at the mercy of the winds and the currents. We go back a bit. So if you look at Tahiti there in the middle, and up to Hawaii, is 2,500 miles. So if you can go from Tahiti and you can go north for 300 miles, and you still have 2,200 miles to go. And at that point, you're uh, at the mercy of the winds and the currents. The bottom line is, you would never, your chances of making it to Hawaii are zero, because the winds and the currents would not allow it. And that's just a fact. So. The Polynesian Voyaging Society <clears throat> got together, these three individuals, Herb Kavainui Kane, an artist and historian, Ben Finney, uh, an uh, anthropologist by um, education, and uh, Tommy Holmes, a, a young adventurer and waterman. And uh, they decided, through the urging of others, to take up this challenge and to document and prove that that just wasn't true, that 300 miles of a journey from Tahiti, and this is a historical journey. Many canoes came up from Tahiti. That historic, historical journey like that was done purposely. So the first thing was to build this voyaging canoe. This is Hokulea. This is a launching on March 8, 1975. First canoe of its type built in Hawaii in 600 years. You can imagine how scary that must have been. This is the training process. Now, the canoe looks much different like this today. It's look, looked much different like this over the years. And um, this was the typical learning process, how to take those first baby steps to figure out how to handle this canoe. It's 62 feet long, it's 21 feet wide. Uh, fully loaded is uh, 12 and a half tons. And there's about 800, 900 square feet of sail on it. So there's a lot of power and drive. And um, how to balance that, and nobody knew how to balance all of that. Nobody knew how to really um, handle that. So, was quite a wild time. This man is from uh, Satawal. It's a small island in the Yap States in Micronesia. He's the last of a line of navigators for over 2,000 years that came down through nav master to apprentice, from master to apprentice all the way down. And the reason he's the last is because <clears throat> he was being trained before the World War II became active and the Japanese overran the islands of Micronesia and met much of the Pacific. And um, at that point, there was um, wholesale suppression and oppression of everything that was cultural. They couldn't sail anymore, they couldn't do much. And, um, but he had already learned the art as a young man. He had already sailed many miles as a young man. <clears throat> and just by luck, when they were looking for a navigator, he was in Hawaii at a conference. And um, so just a serendipitous thing. They got, he got together with the founders, and he agreed to take this challenge. And if you think about it, let me talk about navigation for a while. The tools that you need as a, uh, indigenous navigators. During the day, it's the sun, 
the clouds, the ocean swells, and the wind. That is your compass. Those are your guides. Those are your clues for orientation. At night, you have the stars, the clouds, the wind, the ocean swells, the moon, which you also have during the day as well. <clears throat> and that's part that, that is all part of your uh, compass for orientation. Now, when you think about it, what does a navigator, as far as stars, need to know? You need to know over 200 stars, which stars rise up south and set up south, I mean, uh, up north of the equator, and which ones are your southern stars, where they rise and where they uh, set. Also, their position in their, uh, the highest point of the sky in the meridian before they set. These are all things that you got to know and you got to follow. The moon, within um, our normal journey of 2,000 miles, take us about three weeks. The moon will pretty much go through almost one complete cycle from new moon to new moon. And uh, you need to know <clears throat> how the moon moves um, in front of the backdrop of stars and how to keep track of all that. I mean, there's a, there's a lot I'm giving you here, but this is the kind of things that the navigator needs to learn. Mao was taught at a very, very young age by his father and his grandfather. And his scope of knowledge was just completely amazing. I don't even think we tapped into a quarter of it. So Mao agreed to do this voyage. This is a canoe in 1976 on its way to Tahiti. And the stories that came back from this voyage were utterly amazing. I mean, it was a glimpse into the past by all of those who were on board who sailed. They had never seen anything like it. They never imagined anything like it. Because the navigation was so intense, because Mao had never sailed south of the equator ever in his life, but his mastery of the art was, was such that um, that didn't matter. But he didn't sleep for two weeks straight. He didn't sleep. It, it was so, the whole effort was so intense that he just kept at it. This is the arrival of uh, Hokulea in Tahiti, in Papayete, in June 2nd, 1976. It's a great picture, and the, the people of Tahiti, like the people of Hawaii, were waiting for this canoe. This is their ancestral connection. Now, we talk about ancestral connections. <clears throat> Over the years, we've learned so many um, stories and direct connections. So just one. Uh, direct connection. In Hawaii, um, there's a family, last name is Pawa. And in Tahiti, there's a Pawa family in the, er in the area of Mataea. This is the same family. In Rapa Nui, there's a Pawa clan. This is the same family. In Aotearoa, there's a tribe called Nati Pawa. This is all the same family. So these connections um, are, are um, not only real, they're, um, they're genealogical in a sense. I mean, we've lost a lot of those ties, but these names are the, are the link. I think most of, most of us have heard of Murphy's Law. This is real. This is real. Um, we're very much aware of it. We train for it. And um, we have been um, the victim of it, I guess you could say. 
So the canoe gets home in 1976. That was the end of the project. This canoe was built for a 5,000 mile uh, project to be documented. The navigation was to be documented, life at sea, the sailing um, performance of the va'a, the canoe, and all of that was to be documented. But when the canoe got home in 1976, <clears throat> it had um, expanded awareness of the possibilities of things that could be. And some of the canoe, most of the crew members went home because that was the expectation. A core of them stuck around, they took care of the canoe, and they tried to envision um, a next step. So we planned for this voyage in 1980, uh, uh, 1978, in two years. This was the result and uh, the ending of that voyage. The day we left, it was gale force winds. The channels between the islands were beyond small, small craft warnings. And the canoe, uh, one of the hull on the left there, you see how it's deeper in the water, filled up with water and swamp. And the canoe uh, went over at 10 at night, 10 o'clock at night. So I was on the canoe. Most of us were rescued. My Coast Guard helicopter eventually came out, plucked us from the sea at like midnight and got us home and we got the canoe back. Now let me just step back a little bit and talk about You know, we talk about colonialism, we talk about cultural apathy, we talk about um, self-invalidation. You know, in Hawaii, I guess, same as uh, m many other places, there was a bit of shame on being Hawaiian. There was a whole generation where uh, parents did not give their children Hawaiian names a whole generation. There was a sense of shame there. There was also an expectation that what we were gonna do was gonna end in failure. And um, many people that are uh, older than me that had a chance to be a part of this voyage in 1976, they really found it exciting. They wanted to be a part of it. But their mentors and uh, some of their uh, family members, elders, told them, don't waste your time. Don't waste your time being a part of this. It's not going to feed your family. You know, it's not going to do much for you as you proceed through life and stuff like that. So don't waste your time. That was part of that apathy. That was part of that low ebb of our cultural uh, connection to our ancestors. And quite, ba quite uh, frankly, people never thought we were just not good enough. So Hokulea, this is the end of the second voyage. And you would think that the um, the canoe, that would be it. That would be it. That would be the end of voyaging. One of our crew members, his name was Eddie Aikau. He's a world-famous surfer and waterman. He took a surfboard. He was going to uh, paddle to the island of Lanai, which he thought was nine miles away. Best estimate, nine miles. But when they, when they found us, we were 29 miles from that island. And he took this uh, surfboard. He was going to paddle 29 miles into this uh, developed sea and wind to go look for help. Well, we lost him. And because we lost Eddie, and there's a loss of life, and this expected outcome of uh, a Hawaiian um, endeavor, that was it for voyaging. But, like many of the talks that I've been hearing, you know, the sense of courage the sense of looking forward and not giving in to that, that very um, notion of, of 
self-invalidation or invalidation. This is Uncle Myron Pinky Thompson. Out of high school, as an 18-year-old, 17-year-old, signed up for the draft. He was one of the uh, young men at 19 years old storming the beach in Normandy in World War II with all the thousands of individuals fighting for freedom in the uh, world against <clears throat> tyranny and all of that. And uh, he got injured while crossing across France, trying to get to uh, Germany and do his duty. Um, after a bit of healing, Army Hospital, went to college, got a degree in uh, social work, came home to Hawaii, and his whole purpose was to help these Hawaiian people. So as a social worker, came home, got his master's degree in social work, and dedicated his life <clears throat> to finding out a way to break the code and to break this link and to move forward. So Uncle Pinky at this time, he, you know, every, everyone was pretty much certain that voyaging was finished. And he just said, look, it's important that you folks get back on the horse and we do this. 95% of our success is going to be in planning. We didn't do a real good job on that one. Part of that 95% is finding the teachers. So we had to go back to Satawa, look for Mao Piai Lug, bring him to Hawaii to help be a part of this. At that time, he was not. <clears throat> but the most profound thing that Uncle Pinky told us was, this cannot be the legacy of voyaging and our efforts, our cultural efforts. He says, how many generations, if, if, if this is, if we walk away and leave this as our legacy, how many generations will go by before people start to forget that that is the common thread, failure? How many generations? He said, no. <clears throat> we're not going to, that's, that's not going to be it. So you guys got to have to figure this out. And the core from that point on to today are the values, the shared values, the common values that um, will lead how we're going to do this. So, just moving ahead forward. Hokulea got... Um, redesigned to not let flooding uh, be a part of this uh, disabled vessel at sea. In 1985, we sailed to the southeast, southwest corner of the Polynesian Triangle. This is the Bay of Islands in Aotearoa. This Wakatawa here from Aotearoa, its name is Natoki Mata Faurua. Natoki Mata Faurua is a name of a voyaging canoe from um, Aotearoa. So this is 1985. This is 1999. We closed the Polynesian Triangle. This is uh, sailing to Rapa Nui um, in the southeast corner. And in 2007, we made a voyage up to Miles Island in Sato Island and on to Japan. Now, let me just talk about these canoes. Um, and I also want to call some others into this room. <clears throat> Hawaii Loa, Maveke. Wahialoa, Pa'ao, Moikeha, Paumakua, Kahai, from, uh, from Rapa Nui Hotumatua, from Aotearoa, Natoruirangi, from Tahiti, Tupaya, from Marquesas, Toi. And this is a short list of thousands of, of navigators on traditional va'a, like Hokulea, 
through the centuries. These are all part of this, uh, this legacy. So when you want to talk about 300 miles and purposely and the rest of it being willy-nilly by currents and winds, um, it just, it's just not going to happen. So a small, just a, a small treatise in Aotearoa, Kupe was the individual who um, is credited with uh, founding uh, and finding the island of Aotearoa. He went back home to uh, Tahiti. He gave the sailing directions. Many, many canoes sailed there. Some of them did multiple voyages, round trips, to get others and to come back. Now, if that doesn't sound purposeful, I don't know what does. In 19, uh, in 2000, and actually, we did, we did this uh, worldwide voyage that started in 2014, but actually the seed for this voyage was planted in 1992. In 1992, we did a voyage down to the Cook Islands and back from Tahiti. <clears throat> in partnership with uh, NASA for education. It was the first voyage where education became the hub and the focal point of the voyaging. And one of the astronauts on board was a uh, gentleman who grew up in Hawaii. His name was Lacey Veach. He had planted the seed. He said, you know, the beauty of the voyaging and what you folks are doing, you should take it around the world and uh, share it and um, that was his vision. So in 2009, we took the canoe out of the water. She was um, tired. There was rot. Uh, and we worked on her, and we relaunched her in uh, 2012 on her birthday, March 8th. And we trained over 300 sailors to be a part of this voyage around the world. And you can see the route. We started up in Hawaii, down to Tahiti, across to Aotearoa, over here to Sydney, up to Darwin, and then up to Bali and across the Indian Ocean to South Africa, and then across the South Atlantic, up to Brazil, and up the eastern seaboard of the U.S., back through Panama, and then back to Hawaii in 2017. 47,000 miles a little over three years, uh, many, many stops. And you see at the top, it says Malama Honua. <clears throat> Malama means to care for. It's one of the core values. And it's much more than leaving a place um, exactly how you found it. Malama in his true sense is when you leave a place, you've made a difference. You've left it in a better state than you found it. And that's the whole drive for this voyage and for uh, voyages that are coming up. And the whole, the whole idea of it was that there is no um, it's not a secret that our environment on island Earth is in trouble. There's more pollution and plastics in the ocean um, than anybody ever thought possible. And it's growing daily. And it's a big problem. Um, there's other things going on that are uh, very harmful and detrimental to the ocean. And as we learn through science, the oceans are the lungs of this planet. People think that our forests are the lungs of this planet for, for producing oxygen. This planet is 75% water. These oceans are what's producing every third breath that we take. Just understanding some of this, you know, it becomes a little bit more urgent as far as doing something.
just doing something to help out. Um, and again, you know, we, when we got ready to do this voyage, it wasn't about us on the canoe having solutions. It's about making connections. We understand that indigenous wisdom, we really truly believe in indigenous wisdom is the key to moving forward and healing this planet and um, our land and our seas and people. And when we're leaving to do this voyage, oh, you should have heard the, the debates about how risky it is, and you can't do this, and you gotta worry about this, and good grief, after a while, it's so insurmountable, it's like, okay, well, maybe we shouldn't go. But the real question is, <clears throat> what's the safer thing to do? To keep the canoe tied to the dock and talk about it? Or to sail and try and do something about it? What's the safer thing to do? So that for us, the safest thing to do is to get up back out there and to make an attempt to make these connections and um, move forward and try to do something. One of my cousins that I talked to the other day, she talked about fear. And she says, all it is, she goes, fear stops you from seeing what's possible. It stops you from seeing what's possible. So that's one of our watchwords, is it, uh, and little phrases for sailing. What's the riskier thing? To stay tight at the dock because you're afraid to do it, or to uh, let those lines go? So we decided we went on this voyage, a lot of help from a lot of people. This is in uh, Minjiraba, Kwandamuka country. Stradbroke Island, we got into Brisbane. Again, same thing. Uh, my wife was on the team here that traveled around ahead of us asking permission to come to your lands. This is in South Africa. This is up on the, uh, one of the, the groups up in, um, on the East Coast, the Native Americans. And this is coming home in 2017. When Hokulea started off, this is Hokulea down here. In 1975, like I said, it was a first voyage in canoe built in 600 years. Here we are in 2017. We have all these other voyaging canoes lined up there that were part of the homecoming. <clears throat> if you're wondering what the, the canoes are for, they're for education. They're for exploration. They're for envisioning possibilities. Um, from the very beginning, that was there for. Get over the horizon. Find out what's there and what is possible. This is a native Hawaiian fish pond. This is called Paipaioheia. You know, when you talk about sovereignty, you talk about ownership. In the 1970s, there was a huge uh, flood that came down from the mountains. And the, the amount of water blew out this fish pond. This fish pond had been, is hundreds of years old. And this fish pond would produce thousands of tons of fish per year that could feed a large community. And this is one of 100 fish ponds on Oahu, by the way. And many of them are gone because they weren't valued. And this is one of the remaining ones. So when the big flood came through, it breached the walls of the fish pond and opened up like 50 feet. 
And so the fish pond was basically not functional at that time. So we came home with Hokule on the 1980 vo uh, voyage. That was the second voyage of uh, Hokule. Uh, we did not know where to put her. So they, they took her around from Honolulu, is on the, over the mountains on the other side. They towed her around, put her in the fish pond over here on this side where you see all the mangrove. And they anchored her there because we didn't have any vision for the near future. When they went back to look for her in 1983, they did not see her. The mangroves had grown around the canoe. And through the three years of rain, the canoe had filled up with water and sunk. It was sitting on the bottom. So they had to cut through the mangroves and take the canoe out, and we got her going again. But over the years, there were people in Hawaii that wanted to close up the uh, breach in these walls and do something. And the state of Hawaii kept telling them, no, oh, you know, you got to do an archaeological study and you got to do this. And so people walked away from it. No, no action. So <clears throat> about somewhere in 2000, this young Hawaiian woman, her name is Hi'ileka Velo. She got a degree in uh, environmental sciences, Hawaiian culture, and all of this. She took ownership. She rallied a community. And people would come down by the hundreds on the weekends and line up on one side of the wall and pass stones. So you had, you know, 10-year-olds, 11-year-olds, 60-year-olds, 7-year-olds, and they'd come back. And there's like hundreds of thousands of man hours. It took them about eight years, but they closed up that breach in the wall. That's ownership. And here's the kids. At the, this is called a makaha. This is where the water flows in and out. And that sluice gate there is let the small fish in and they keep the larger fish uh -uh, from going, going out. But this is uh, after the closure of, of uh, 50 feet of breach. Again, it's one of those things. Nobody thought that uh, it was going to be done. It was just too massive. And that's why, you know, with ownership and kuleana, which is responsibility, it's all about navigating to that uh, point. You know, um, quick story. I know Ku talked about the language schools. I was talking to a, a cousin of ours. She was involved with uh, one of the training schools. In 1896, Hawaiian language was outlawed. Legally, there were laws that said you could not teach Hawaiian language in schools. You could not use it in the courtrooms. And um, that was it. Kids were beaten in schools for speaking their native tongue. 1986, when they started a school on the Big Island, one of the first things they had, the big first challenge was, was to change that law so they could teach Hawaiian language in a school. And um, their vision was to take these, these children from kindergarten all the way up to graduation in 12th grade. Oh, you should have heard the pushback from the community. I mean, it just kept coming. You're not going to prepare them for college. You're not doing them a favor. I mean, uh, uh, you know, how are you going to do this, whatever? The long and short of it was they had the courage to go ahead and do it. This uh, graduating class, nine out of 10 of them went on to get their uh, master's or a PhD. Now they are the leaders in a lot of the language schools that have blossomed throughout the state. This is uh, Nainoa Thompson. He's a president of the Vo Polynesian Voyaging Society and our first Hawaiian navigator in 600 years in Hawaii. 
And one of the one of the key things about moving forward is education. How do we prepare our future generations of um, native children to be the next leaders and stewards uh, within our islands and within island earth? And you see, uh, so the, one of the things that was uh, going around was talking to people at these different schools who are making a difference and um, trying to capture the essence of that. And then it gets us to um, the future, training the next navigators. So now Kaleo Wong here, Kaleo Manuiva Wong, is part of the fourth generation of navigators that were uh, actively navigating in the native way around the earth. This is Haunani Kane. So Kaleo just got his uh, master's degree in uh, cultural environmental sciences. Haunani Kane just got her uh, PhD in environmental sciences, uh, mostly relating to um, sea level rise and climate change. This is Kailani Murphy. She's a professor at the Honolulu Community College that teaches mainly voyaging and other cultural aspects. And here's also, uh, this is Lehua Kamalu who's also one of our uh, young navigators and leaders in the community. So you can see how, and this is Jason uh, Patterson. All of these people are um, in their mid-20s. They're navigators. This 47,000 mile journey of Hokulea around the world was navigated without a compass, without GPS, by these young Hawaiians men and women, young men and young women. At this point, this is uh, Kanehunomoku, it's floating classroom. This is one of the charter schools in the islands. Uh, most of the language is, uh, that's taught is in Hawaiian, and they get out to sea regularly to learn about being in the environment and working together. <clears throat> This is another charter school. And a lot of the kids, the same thing. These, this is a uh, Hawaiian immersion school where they're going out uh, pretty regularly when the weather uh, allows these youngsters and learning how to feel the waves and be at sea and learning in that, uh, that con uh, classroom. You know, in the end, it's about vision, it's about dreams, it's about the possibilities of things, um, and not ignoring that. And it's how do we take our next generation to that point, and what kind of experiences we give them. This bird is called Manuoku, it's a navigator's bird. When you, you're coming up to your, um, your target island, and you're still 200 miles away, you cannot see the island, but you know where it is in your mind. These guys come out to sea daily to feed and they go home to feed their young. And you start to see them. And every day is different for them, every day is different for the navigators at sea. And it's all about making decisions. So what next? Hokulea, what next? We have a voyage coming up in uh, two years. That's the plan. Leaving Hawaii in 2020. Doesn't really show it real good, but the, the voyage is gonna be um, <clears throat> Pacific Rim. It's gonna start up in, um, in Alaska. And it's gonna come down the west coast of the Americas, all the way down to Chile, where Christina's from. And then across the South Pacific, through Rapa Nui, uh, Marquesas, Tuamotus, Tahiti, Cook Island, Samoa, Tonga, Aotearoa, up through Australia, and then into uh, 
uh, Melanesia up here, right above Australia, and then up to the Philippines, China, Japan, Korea, and Russia. And the whole, well, not the whole, but the main crux of it is that our common bond, if you will, is the Pacific Ocean. It's the biggest and largest body of water on this planet. And it is pretty in pretty bad shape. So how do we all take a bit of ownership for it and do our best to move forward and to uh, ensure that the future generations, um, we've done something to leave it in a better place. So there we are. Earth is an island, and how do we live on islands? So I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you very much.